morning. If you're new here and wondering who in the world I am, my name is Lee. I'm a retired pastor. This is our church, and uh, it's a real privilege for me to be able to preach here. I preach a few times in other places, but to be here with my church is really a, a gift, and I'm grateful to Pastor Dave for giving me this opportunity and uh, for you to listen. It's Palm Sunday, as we noticed and heard in the scripture and the songs, and uh, it's a great day. I hate to tell you, but I'm not going to preach about Palm Sunday. Uh, Dave and, and Michael and I and the others, we decided we'd kind of stick in our series with John, so that's what we're going to be doing uh, this morning. By the way, what a great job our leaders all did this morning, from the piano and from the worship team. They were just great. Thank you. It was great to sing that old uh, Palm Sunday hymn at the beginning and to sing these new songs. The children, man, I love seeing children. I pastored a church for a while. We had almost no children. And so when I see children up in front, it's really a delight to me. I'm really thankful. I want to, I know Margie just prayed, but I, I'd like to pray also. Would you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> Lord, it's been a tumultuous week. I pray for the believers surrounding that awful tragedy in uh, Nashville, that school, and those children pastor, head of the school, his precious little ones and their families and loved ones. Today must be a hard day for them, and I pray your grace would shower upon them, and your comfort would come to them. And here, Father, a terrible storm. We don't know who the people are, at least I don't, who were injured or killed, but we pray for those families as well, for those people. And we give you thanks that despite damage here and there, we are okay. Lord Jesus, people are hungry and thirsty here in Rockford. And uh, you have brought us to this place where we can be fed and drink living water. And I'm grateful that I get to preach, and I pray that you'd help me in my weakness. I pray for my friends here that you would give them grace to track and listen. I pray for Pastor Dave and Gretchen as they're away, that you would uh, rest them and give them joy with the people who they're with as, who have been really significant in their lives. So this I put before you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. I thought about doing what Dave did a few weeks ago and ask, going around and asking you a question. Uh, the question I was going to ask, and I do ask actually, is how was it that Jesus first began to introduce himself to you? And it would really be interesting to hear, but when I remember Dave running hither and yon with a microphone, I thought, that'd kill me. I, I, I cannot go that way. I, I would hurt myself, and it would be a, a, just a really messy morning. So I decided not to do that. But nonetheless, I would ask you, how was it that Jesus first introduced himself to you? There was a woman in our, uh, the church where I served most recently in Lincolnshire, in, uh, near Chicago, whose name was Widya. She was from Indonesia. She was Muslim. Jesus first introduced himself to her in a dream where he appeared in white. And I have a friend who first started hearing about Jesus with college friends. And eventually he came to faith. For me, I was just a little guy. I've known about Jesus as long as I can remember. My little hometown and my mom and dad and I asked Jesus into my heart before I went to school. 
I don't know, four or five years old. We all have a story how Jesus first introduced himself to us. Last week, Pastor Dave told us the story about the, uh, from John 4, where we're going to be here again today, John chapter 4, where Jesus met and talked deeply with a Samaritan woman who'd come to get water from Jacob's well near the town of Sychar, which in the Old Testament was Shechem. It's a famous site. Uh, Jesus was traveling. He was traveling uh, northward from Jerusalem to uh, Galilee, where he wanted to resume uh, go back to where he had been, that's where he was from, and he had to pass through Samaria, and many of you know that that wasn't typically a happy trip for uh, Jews to make because they didn't get along with Samaritans. This wasn't just a racial thing. The Samaritans were sort of spiritual half-breeds. They were sort of Jewish. Their heritage went back to Judaism. There are still Samaritans, by the way. They're still a group of that uh, background. But they had uh, long before abandoned most of the scriptures. So in their Bibles, if they had a, you know, a Bible, they only took the first five books. They just took this much. And they didn't listen to the rest. They didn't give credence to anything other than the books of Moses. Now, if you don't have anything but the books of Moses, there's some important things you don't know, things you don't believe. For one, you don't believe that it's important to go to Jerusalem to worship God, as God had commanded. And you don't believe that there's a Messiah coming, at least not the kind of Messiah that the rest of the Old Testament promises. You don't believe in a Messiah who will be the son of David, because you don't think David was significant. In fact, he wasn't even your king. And you don't believe that this son of David would one day uh, come and deliver his people Israel from their enemies and their sin. You don't believe any of that. The Samaritans did believe in a kind of picture of a Messiah. Uh, They didn't really even call him that very often. They used the word Taheb which might be translated restorer. And uh, they get this from one verse particularly, more than one, but particularly where Moses said, he made a promise that there would be a Messiah coming, and this was what Moses said about him. I will, God is speaking here. Moses is reporting what God said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. So to the Samaritans, the coming Messiah, Taleb, would be somebody who sort of renewed the telling. He would be a new prophet. And Jesus certainly was that. Jesus did fulfill his promise. But they erased everything else. So that's why when Jesus met this Samaritan woman, I don't know if you remember this from Dave's message last week, but at one point she says, I know that Messiah is coming. So they knew that. When he comes, what will he do? He'll explain everything to us. Well, that's true. Jesus did. On the road to Emmaus, on the Easter Sunday, He met those disciples and he started to tell them everything in the Old Testament that pointed to him. He'll explain everything. True enough. True enough. But even knowing that about the Messiah, she didn't really understand what Jesus meant because her view of Messiah was so small. She didn't really understand when Jesus said, I, the one who is speaking to you, I'm he. 
Now, Pastor Dave last week brought us up to that point, this great story, and then he kind of pasted a big to-be-continued sign over this whole story, and that's where I pick up with you today. So if you haven't already, I want to look in your Bibles. We're in John 4, and the story resumes in verse 27. This is what it says. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, a Samaritan woman, a Jewish rabbi speaking with a Samaritan woman. Everything's wrong about that picture for them. But no one asked, what do you want? Or, why are you talking to her? Now, i got to tell you, all the other times I've read this, I blasted right past that verse. But what kind of an author would tell us what no one said? Isn't that a curious thing? Why would an author tell us what no one said? It's always he said, she said, this said. Here he says, no one asked of her, what do you want? And of Jesus, why are you talking with her? Mm. Why is that verse even there? Is it just a throwaway? Nothing is a throwaway. Nothing. Those are the questions that good disciples of Jesus should ask. Those are the questions that good disciples of Jesus should ask. The really important question to ask the Samaritan, would have been, a Samaritan woman would have been, what do you want? That's really what Jesus had been learning from her. If we go back and read that story, he's finding out what she really wants, more than she even knew, right? Whether she realized it or not, she really wanted living water for her heart. And she wanted her fractured life. Five husbands and the man he was with, she was with was not her husband. Her fractured life, she wanted it to be made whole. What do you want? Michael, you'll remember this. When I was teaching counseling at the seminary, there was a quote I made my class memorize because I heard it in seminary from Dr. Wearsby. I don't know who said it originally. It's this. Be kind, for every person you meet is fighting a great battle. Be kind, for every person you meet is fighting a great battle. Some don't know it. Some do. But it's essentially the question, what do you want? And the really important question Jesus' disciples should have asked Jesus was that other question. Why are you talking with her? What possessed you to talk with her? And that's what we're going to look at this morning in this part of the story. That's what Jesus is going to tell them in the rest of this passage, why he was talking with her. Now, why did Jesus, way back when, whenever it was for you, maybe it's this morning, why did Jesus talk with you the first time? In those early days of getting to know Jesus, why did he talk with you? Why did he talk with me? Whether we come from a deeply religious background like the Reverend Dr. Nicodemus that Dave told us about, or from a hopelessly confused, dysfunctional, irreligious life like this woman, why did Jesus talk with you? Why did he pay attention to you? and draw you 
to believe in him. Well, let's pick up that story again in verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, that's just significant because it tells you she plans to come back. Right? She wouldn't leave her jar if she wasn't going to come back. Things don't grow on trees, you know. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Oh, take a picture of that. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Just hold that picture. So back to that important unasked question of Jesus. Why are you talking to her? Why did he talk to you? So let's read on. Verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. You see them looking at each other like, what does that mean? The disciples said to each other, could somebody have brought him food? Somebody brought him water. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. By the way, as an aside here, I know that when Dave preaches, he gives you his notes and everything's there. Today you got to get your pen out and fill in the blanks. Yeah. And there will be a test before you leave. And you don't leave till you get it done. And the donuts are gone. <laughs> so, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So here's the the first of two big ideas this morning. Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, and he still talks to people now by his Spirit, because doing the Father's will is the food God's people live by. Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, and he still talks to people now by his Spirit, because doing the Father's will is the food God's people live by. Where did this language come from, this food language? Well, it has, it's a, a rich back, background. You probably know it if, you, if it if you can connect the dots. There'd be like a blue hyperlink here in a, if it was maybe on a computer. Jesus got this idea, this food language, from what God told Moses 1,500 years before. This was in Deuteronomy 8.3, where Moses was reminding the Israelites before they went into the promised land of how God had humbled them their 40 years in the wilderness. And how, uh, and then the reason was, and this is what it says in Deuteronomy 8.3, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Man does not live on bread alone. Remember we heard that in the wilderness when the tempter came to Jesus and offered him food. He says man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. One writer explained that this way. The creative will of God realized in obedience, that's how we see his creative will, sustains life. That's really good. So what was the word that Jesus was feeding on? Well, there's lots of ways to put it, but one we, we know uh, is John 3.16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
Jesus was feeding on that, on that truth. That's why he came. And from Mark 10.45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the food Jesus was eating. That's the word God had given him before he even came. That was God's great commission for Jesus. That's why talking to this Samaritan woman was food for his soul. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What do you think that means? What were Jesus' last words from the cross? There you go. It is finished. That's when he finished the work God had brought him to do. To save the world. That was completed when Jesus died for our sins, died in our place, so that we might not be condemned, but rather live forever. That was his work. That was his food. And every opportunity that he got to obey that commission was food for him, for his heart. Jesus' disciples, followers of Jesus, have a special diet. Good news, it doesn't have to be vegan. (laughs) Our food is to do the will of God. And nothing is dearer to God than drawing people out of their night, like Nicodemus, out of their thirst, like the woman at the well, to believe in Jesus for everlasting life. And he employs us in that work in various ways along the way. Various contacts and relationships and words and prayers. Our role is to do what Jesus did to step into other people's lives as God prompts us. Not everybody, just the ones that God prompts. You kind of know. You just sense, i got to talk to this guy. I should be talking to this person. Strike up friendships. Step into people's mess. Offer to help a co-worker or a neighbor. Invest time in praying for people. Give money to ministries or people who are evangelizing, taking the gospel. To do that is manna for your heart. That'll feed you. Now, Jesus changes his word picture in the next verses. Instead of talking about food, he switches to a different metaphor. So let's listen to uh, verses 35 to 38. going to find it here. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest? Well, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage. That just means the one who reaps uh, just got hired. Reapers just got hired. And harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, here's another saying, one sows and another reaps. Well, that's really true. I sent you to reap what you haven't worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you've reaped the benefits of their labor. So here's the second point. Jesus talked to this Samaritan woman, and he still talks to people now by his Spirit, because the harvest has finally come. The harvest has finally come. Apparently that Jesus is picking up on a proverb. I gather that everybody knew and used in other ways for various things. We have proverbs like that. It's still four months to the harvest. Is it Christmas yet? No, it's still four months till the harvest. Right? Everything's going to work out in the end. It's still four months to the harvest. 
Maybe they used it like that, kind of a common expression. I'm not sure, but this proverb particularly applied in, in the scriptures, in the mind of the Israelites, to the hope that God had been instilling in them for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years they had been waiting. Going back to Abraham, the promise to Abraham that every nation in the world would be blessed through you. And the clock started. Tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 tick. So, so, so. That promise had been repeated and expanded for all the centuries of the Old Testament. There would be a Messiah. He would be a son of David. He'd reign forever. He'd save his people. Tick, 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 tick. Psalms. The prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea and Zechariah and all the way to Malachi sowing the seed. Tick, 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 tick. Can you see it like in the movies, the pages flying off the calendar? Sowing, waiting. And they'd say, well, it's still four months till the harvest. Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, just a few verses, few lines before the very end, he says, for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves, sowing and waiting. There was not another prophet for 400 years. 400 years. That would like in our time be before Columbus. 400 years, not another word from the Lord directly like that. Tick, 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 tick. Sowing, waiting, still not the harvest. Then John the Baptist burst on the scene. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. He pointed at Jesus and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The waiting was over. All those people whom John baptized were people who repented of their sins and were ready for the Messiah. They weren't saved by getting baptized. They were made ready. Their hearts were clean. Bring it on. And here in Samaria, among the most hard-hearted, spiritually blind people, a woman whose life was broken in six pieces is ready to be harvested, and her whole town with her. Look again at what she said, remember? When she got back to her town, Sychar, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Oh, what was that like? Now, the well wasn't far from the town. Why would you build a town far away from the well? It wasn't far. So I picture the disciples with Jesus having this conversation, and they can see people start to come. I think that's the mental picture we're supposed to have. And Jesus says, that's what I'm talking about. That's the harvest. One of the emphases in this, these verses is the joy of the harvest, right? Uh, Many of you grew up in or in, on farms or near farms, and you know that harvest is a big deal. It's the joy. And, and the text says, so that the sower and the 
reaper may be glad together. Harvest is a big deal. My dad wasn't a farmer, but we lived in a small farming town. We went to a church where everybody else but the pastor was a farmer. I know about harvests. I know the tension that builds over the summer when storm clouds gather or when, they're, when they don't, when there's not enough rain. When they worry about weeds or pests, counting, checking the quality of the crops, keeping their eye on the calendar, checking, is the moisture right? And then comes the harvest. There's nothing quite like, I know this isn't New Testament language, but there's nothing quite like seeing combines in a harvest field. Seeing those sheaves brought down, brought in. Wow, it's a big day. It's a big day. There's your income for the year. There's your, the fruit of all your work. Now, in Jesus' picture, the sowers, who I believe he means these Old Testament sowers, it's as though, you know, you could have a big reunion, like they could come back, sort of, and gather with Jesus and his disciples, and this is what we were waiting for. This is the day. Let's, we got to rejoice. Let's have a feast and celebrate. He says to the disciples, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Now, to be particular, they hadn't actually reaped anything yet, the disciples themselves. Or if they had, John hasn't told us about it here. But they will. They're the reapers. Now, I know, and I'm comfortable with this language, that we will speak about our own uh, harvest fields, our own fields. We'll talk about the, the fields in Rockford, or a missionary will talk about the fields wherever they go. And there are times where fields are, are uh, not ripe. People are sowing the seed, they're spreading the gospel, and waiting for it to kind of take root, and it takes a long time in some places. And I get that language. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. I think he is saying that with his coming, there was a new, you might call it a harvest era that was beginning. Because once the work was finished, which was when Jesus died on the cross, then the work of reaping people for the gospel could begin. It really couldn't begin before that. There were believers, to be sure, but the real reaping started after Jesus died and rose again. You follow? So I get that we have fields and all, but I don't think that's his point here. So when Jesus died on the cross, and make no mistake, he was really dead, lifeless, powerless, God saw that the work of redemption was completed. It was finished. And the Father, seeing that, the Father is the one who raises Jesus from the dead because the work is done. Everything needed to be done was done. Everything that needed to be done to save people from their sins had been accomplished. Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead. The Father raised him in recognition that his work was done. And then he ascended on high to sit at the right hand of the Father. That's the real triumphal entry. We could sing all glory, laud, and honor again. We could sing Hosanna again, right? That's the real triumphal entry. When the Lord Jesus, having accomplished everything, finished the work, rose into the air on the Mount of Olives with his disciples watching. And he took his place at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's pretty cool. The harvest season had begun. Well, let's 
finish up this story. So all those people from Sychar, this town, near that ancient well of their ancestor Jacob. This really, that's part of this story. This is the well of Jacob. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. I mean, that is an old place. That well is still there, by the way. It's under, you know, a church or something, and you've got to kind of know how to get in. It's just a hole in the ground. But that well is still there. But all these people started coming out of town and making their way to Jesus. You can't miss this picture. The fields are white unto harvest, and they turn, and here comes people. Now, I don't know if the uh, Samaritans then did this, but the pictures I've seen of modern Samaritans, they're all in white. I don't know where that comes from. I didn't study it. But can you imagine? Look, Jesus says, the fields are white unto harvest. They turn and look around, and here they come. What a great picture. Well, let's finish the story. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town did what? Say it for me. All right, let's make sure we get this. They believed in him because of the woman's testimony. What was her testimony? He told me everything I ever did. Really, all that did it was here's a man who knows somebody's past that they, he couldn't know apart from supernatural revelation. That's really all they're working on. Think how much more we know. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because, his wor- because of his words, many more became, there you go, say it again. Yeah. They said to the woman, we no longer, just because of what you said. Now we have heard it for ourselves and we, that this man really is the Savior of the world. They were beginning to realize that Jesus was way more than Taheb, the restorer, just the prophet. That was the truth that they had their foot on. It was the truth, and it was important. That's the foot they started with. And then they walked into the truth of the gospel. They wouldn't really, I don't think, really finish till after the resurrection of Jesus. And you remember what it says in Acts 1.8? He says, the last words he says to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He says to go to Judea, that's where Jerusalem is, and where it was next. Samaria, as if to say, they're waiting, they're ready. Just go back to Samaria and tell them how Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, and and they'll be ready. (laughs) These people believed. They knew that, it says, they knew that Jesus really is the Savior of the world. Now, just by way of reminder, why did John tell us this story and all these other stories? John 20, 31, or 30. These are written, you better read it with me. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I want to end with a story 21 years ago, I preached on the story of the woman at the well. It was the last time I did, I think. And uh, a few weeks before that, I happened to be in a print shop, and I got talking to Deanna, who worked there. I knew or figured out somehow that she was a Christian, and somehow we had a conversation, and I began to learn Deanna's story. And that morning that I preached on this passage, I, with fear and trembling, tried something I had only done one other time, and that's what we call in my business a dialogue sermon. So I had met with Diana, and we'd kind of talked through her whole story, and I kind of had a plan, and she, come up, she came up and stood next to me, and we dialogued through the story of the woman at the well. Her story reminded me of this woman's story, not the husband's part, but the lost part, the thirsty part. And I want to just tell you some of what she said. 
and how our interview went. I wish she could be here. She'd grown up in a very bad part of Chicago. She was robbed for the first time when she was in first grade. I asked her, did you think Jesus knew you? Was interested in you? Reply, in you? And she replied, well, I thought he knew of me, but not interested in me. I said, well, what would you have thought that Jesus thought about you? And she said, bet I was a heathen. Wouldn't have asked me for a drink of water. I asked, looking back, what were a couple of the first appointments you had with Jesus, whether you knew it or not? And she told me about the time a pastor stopped at their door, knocked on their door when she was nine. And then she told me about the first time she met Sandy Jensen in a snowstorm. Deanna was 31 and her parents had moved to Kenosha. She drove up to visit them in the middle of a snowstorm and when she got to their house, they weren't home and the doors locked. So it's freezing. She sits out in her car hoping they're gonna come home and her, their neighbor across the street, Sandy, saw this woman sitting in the car in the cold and went and coaxed her to come into the house. It took some doing because Deanna was so suspicious. She was one of those people, maybe you're like this, but she would never sit with her back to a door. She was worried. She was cautious. She was frightened. I asked her, in those days, did you ever pray? When she said yes, I asked her what she prayed for. She said, death. I hated life. I felt I was born to be abused. That's why I started doing drugs at 12. My sister started me on drugs one night at 7.05 p.m. I came to at 10.35. Couldn't remember the three hours. I liked that I couldn't remember. So from then on, I was high every day of my life till I was 31. So I couldn't remember. I did it all. I sold drugs on the street from age 13 to 18. So back to Sandy. Each time that uh, Deanna would go to visit, their paths would cross on purpose. Deanna said, I made, I made a point of striking up conversations and sometime, somehow the subject of God would always come up. It was like I was parched and coming face to face with living water that would quench my thirst. I asked, what were you thirsty for? Him, she said. I wanted him. I knew there was nothing right about me inside and I couldn't be with him. And if I could be with him, it'd be okay. If I could die, it would be okay. I didn't know I could live and be with him. I didn't know I could live and be with him. I wanted God because I wanted to be happy and peaceful. I wouldn't be afraid anymore. I hadn't slept well ever since childhood. To have a good night's sleep would be such a blessing. People would come in at night. The first time I saw someone shot, I was five. Very close. Trauma. I was scared all the time. Well, there's more to this story, but do you know what the last step was for Deanna? She said it was March 15th, 2001, and she asked Sandy, does Jesus love me more than you do? When she heard again that he did, that was the day she put her faith in the Savior, Jesus.
The real question was, what do you want? Why would Jesus talk to you? Why would he talk to you here this morning? He's talking to you. I'm sure of it. We prayed for it, and I know he is. Why would he talk to you? Because the Bible says he came to seek, to look for, and to find lost people. That invitation stands open today. The questions that we go to ask people in one way or another, ever so slowly, ever so kindly, knowing about the great battle is, what do you want? And the question Jesus asks you is, what do you want? Amen. Shall we pray? Well, Lord Jesus, I think we're at the well. I think we're at the well. And you are talking to people here this morning in ways beyond my understanding or knowledge. Thank you. For those who want you, who want to rest their faith in you, pull them into your embrace. Give them a drink of the water that will give them life and spring up within them forever. for us who have known you help us remember that our food is to do the will of the one who sent you to us and that we are reapers in this season of harvest thank you for this word thank you for helping us together to look at it for Jesus sake